Okay, so the second and last chunk of the Lecture 12 series, we're going to wrap up glycolysis permanently now. Uh, four lecture chunks spread across two lectures to tell the whole glycolysis story, and we will be ending it here. So this is part two of glycolysis, again, part of Lecture 12, and we are talking about the dregs of Chapter 17 from the textbook. In chunk A of this uh, Lecture 12 series, we talked about the second phase of glycolysis, where we broke even and then made a 2 ATP profit, but more importantly, we converted two molecules of GAP into two molecules of pyruvate. Here, we'll talk a little bit about the regulation of glycolysis, what the cell looks towards in order to determine whether glycolysis is needed or not, and how, in general at least, the cell can turn glycolysis off. We'll take a side detour to talk a little bit about the metabolism of pyruvate when there's no oxygen around, and we will end by discussing the overall energy yields of glycolysis. <clears throat> so first, again, regulating or controlling glycolysis. As you can probably tell, this is a complicated pathway. We've got 10 steps, 10 enzymes are involved. We burn ATP at the outset. We've got a lot of, um, well, we've got some redox reactions in there, so there's a lot going on. And I'm sure you can also appreciate that with such a complicated uh, reaction scheme, it's a little bit costly for the cell to do this when it doesn't need to be doing this. This is too important of a process to just leave it unregulated. So the question then becomes, if we need to regulate glycolysis, how do we achieve that regulation? It really boils down to energy. The whole point of glycolysis is to make pyruvate. The whole point of making pyruvate is for the cell to make a molecule called acetyl-CoA. The whole point of making acetyl-CoA is to harvest electrons for it. And the whole point of harvesting electrons is to make ATP. So you can make an easy argument that you do glycolysis in order to make ATP. And said another way, if a cell doesn't need ATP, then a cell does not need to do glycolysis. So therefore, it makes the most sense for the cell to be looking at ATP levels when asking itself whether or not it needs glycolysis in play. If ATP levels are low, the cell should be doing glycolysis. If ATP levels are high, the cell should not be doing glycolysis. So the regulation of glycolysis really boils down to three reaction steps. There are three reactions or three control points that, we, uh, that the cell uses to control glycolysis, places where regulation of glycolysis is achieved. Two of them were discussed in the last lecture series. Uh, one of them was discussed recently. Step one is our first control point. We talked about this uh, in some depth, actually, at the time. We talked about feedback inhibition, where the enzyme that controls step one, hexakinase, remember this enzyme phosphorylates kinase, three carbon sugars, hexose. Hexakinase is regulated by its own product. So uh, glucose 6-phosphate turns hexakinase off, and an absence of glucose 6-phosphate allows hexakinase to be active. The other two control points are step 3 and step 10. Both steps 3 and 10 are catalyzed by allosteric enzymes. This is PFK and pyruvate kinase, respectively. And because these are allosteric enzymes, they have secondary binding sites for allosteric effectors. And the allosteric effector that regulates these enzymes potently is ATP itself. Makes sense. If ATP levels are high, these enzymes are inhibited. And so glycolysis halts at step 3 and step 10. This stops the cell from performing glycolysis when ATP levels are high, which makes complete cellular sense. You can imagine that if step 3 is inhibited by ATP, step 2 will begin to back up. The cell will make too much fructose 6-phosphate. Soon after, step 1 will back up. The cell will have too much glucose 6-phosphate on hand because step, 10, step 3 has been shut down. And as soon as glucose 6-phosphate levels climb, they will feedback inhibit hexakinase and glycolysis will shut down completely. So a very, very potent regulation system. This regulation allows communication between the cell at large and glycolysis, all focusing on ATP levels. If ATP levels are low, all enzymes are active and pyruvate is made. If ATP levels are high, step 10 shuts down, so pyruvate will no longer be made. Step 3 shuts down, so fructose 1,6-bisphosphate will no longer be made, and again, that backs up fructose 6-phosphate, which backs up uh, glucose 6-phosphate, which ultimately shuts down step 1, and glycolysis is off. This figure from your textbook shows the regulation of glycolysis quite well. Uh, each of these double bars and Xs are regulation points. So we see three regulation points in glycolysis, step 1, 3, and 10.
Also, this figure shows you what molecule inhibits each of those steps. Step 10 and step 3 inhibited by ATP, and step 1 inhibited by its own product, glucose 6-phosphate. We also see as a side note uh, R1 redox reaction here, which we've talked about as well, step 6. So now that the, we understand how we can regulate glycolysis, let's talk about other things we can do with pyruvate when we've already made it and find that perhaps it's not needed for aerobic metabolism. Um, everything we've talked about so far has been preparation for aerobic metabolism. And everything we will do from this point moving forward, uh, the creation of acetyl-CoA, the citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation will be aerobic respiration as well. It will be oxygen requiring where oxygen is needed to be that uh, final depleted electron trash basket. So we're very concerned most of the time about aerobic respiration and how pyruvate feeds into that aerobic system. However, we'll pick up with the citric acid cycle after spring break in our next lecture, lecture 13. Let's take some time now at the end of this lecture series to talk about the other story, to talk about anaerobic respiration. What happens to pyruvate when oxygen levels are low? Anaerobically, pyruvate can be reduced. Obviously, if it's being reduced, something else is being oxidized, uh, but it can be reduced to lactate. Now, in order to catalyze that reaction, we need NADH plus H. NADH plus H is the electron donor allowing pyruvate to be, to, uh, be reduced into lactate. And then, of course, NADH plus H becomes oxidized to NAD+. So we see that reaction here. It's a one-step reaction. It is catalyzed by the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase, named for the reverse reaction. And pyruvate loses electrons. I'm sorry, pyruvate gains electrons and protons to become lactate. And uh, NAD H plus H is losing and donating those protons and electrons to make that possible. Each of these reactions has a delta G of negative 25.1 kilojoules per mole. Remember, since we've made two pyruvates per one molecule of glucose, we can do this reaction twice per one molecule of consumed glucose. And so if we do that anaerobically, we're generating about 50 kilojoules per mole out of this reaction. Not bad. Pretty good energy yield, especially in the absence of oxygen. However, lactate is not a dead end in our muscle cells. If we have a buildup of lactate, and of course lactate is the conjugate base of lactic acid, I'm sure all of you probably have heard that muscle cramps are due to lactic acid buildup. So we've got to get rid of that lactate from the muscle cells. Muscle cells is primarily where we have anaerobiasis, a depletion of oxygen. And we can do that by sending that lactate to the liver. If we send that lactate to the liver, there are liver enzymes that can recycle it back into pyruvate and even go all the way back into glucose if necessary through a process called gluconeogenesis, which we'll talk about uh, in upcoming lectures. The formation of lactate also helps to recycle reduced NADH back to its oxidized form, NAD+. This is important so that glycolysis itself can continue. NAD plus is needed in glycolysis step six in order to allow glycolysis to move forward. Remember, NAD plus is, is reduced while we have oxidized our gap. If we take all of that reduced NADH plus H, we can recycle it back to its oxidized form with this lactate dehydrogenase reaction. So we actually get a cycle going where gap can be oxidized to 1,3-BPG reducing NAD to NADH plus H, and then NADH plus H can be recycled to its oxidized form by forcing the reduction of pyruvate to lactate. Also important, if we didn't have this kind of feedback loop here in the absence of oxygen, glycolysis itself would shut down completely once all of the NAD had been reduced. Can't have that. Then we have no way to generate energy from respiration whatsoever. So by allowing NADH plus H to regenerate back to its oxidized form, we can keep glycolysis moving forward. Absence of glycolysis is lethal to the cell. Without glycolysis, we have no way of yielding energy from the food we eat. There's another side of this story, though, not true for us, but certainly true for much of life on this planet. Some organisms we know ferment. They make alcohol anaerobically. Some bacteria do this, and uh, many species of yeast do this as well, most notably Saccharomyces cerevisiae, brewer's yeast. The creation of alcohol from pyruvate anaerobically is actually a two-reaction step. First, pyruvate is decarboxylated, 
This is a reaction type where the substrate loses one carbon and two oxygens, therefore loses a carbon dioxide molecule. And we can see that here, when pyruvate is decarboxylated, we yield carbon dioxide, and we also have, as a product of that, acetaldehyde, a two-carbon molecule. This reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme pyruvate decarboxylase. It's a wonderful name for this enzyme. It describes what it does. And incidentally, for fermenting organisms, this carbon dioxide contributes to the fizz that we find in beer and champagne. The second reaction takes acid aldehyde and reduces it to ethanol. The donator of the protons and electrons for that reduction reaction is NADH, which is oxidized back to its NAD plus form, once again regenerating NAD plus for early stages of glycolysis, just as we spoke the same about lactate. So we are once again recycling NADH plus H back to NAD+, plus, so it can go to step 6 of glycolysis and keep glycolysis running. Critically important. The reduced form of acetaldehyde is ethanol. We actually spoke about this reaction way back in our first redox reaction lecture as one of our biochemical examples of redox reactions, so we have some familiarity here. Acetaldehyde gains two protons and two electrons, converting it into ethanol. To move finally to the energetics of glycolysis, Although the point of glycolysis is not to make direct usable energy, but instead to yield pyruvate for the citric acid cycle to make ATP later on, we do make some energy from glycolysis, and it's not really uh, something to thumb our nose at. We profit two molecules of ATP when we can do glycolysis aerobically, which is awesome, which is a good yield. And in addition, we have released a total of 74 kilojoules per mole of energy into the universe, so glycolysis as a 10 reaction pathway is highly exergonic. The universe loves glycolysis because it makes things that much more entropic. I've shown this before, but I love this diagram. Again, this is table 17.1 from your textbook. It breaks everything down. If I were you, this would be my primary study resource for this material on glycolysis because we have the steps numbered all the way on the left. We have the reactions outlined here, the products as well as the substrates. We have the names of the enzymes as well, and this is what I hold you responsible for, knowing the steps, the reactions, and the enzyme names of glycolysis. But we also see the energetics here. You don't need to know the energetics specifically for the exam. Just know that some reactions are highly exergonic, and that glycolysis overall is exergonic as well. But if we take it reaction by reaction, we see that the first step of this process is extremely exergonic. We release a lot of extra energy by busting open that ATP. And so the universe loves reaction one. Reaction two, minimally endergonic, um, but the universe tolerates it because if you do reaction two, look what you get to do next, reaction three, and the universe makes quite a profit from reaction three. Then we get pretty greedy, remember, in step four. We require 24 kilojoules per mole of energy. We require it input into this system in order to proceed. And step five doesn't help us much either with another seven and a half kilojoules per mole. But as we get into the later stages of glycolysis, we see that step seven is highly exergonic. We release two times about 20 kilojoules per mole because we do everything here in parallel. That's why it's two times all of this. So we release about 40 kilojoules per mole of energy in step seven and about 60 kilojoules, of, of, uh, 60 kilojoules per mole of energy in step 10. So the universe tolerates these early endergonic steps because of these later exergonic steps. The cell will not perform step 5 or step 4 unless it can also perform step 10 and step 7. So I think of this as a mega coupling or a super coupling where each of these reactions is coupled to the one before it, and the universe allows the entire process to occur because of the energetic gains that it stands to make. So not a bad deal for the universe, and certainly not a bad deal for the cell, which gets to make pyruvate, which it needs for later stages of aerobic metabolism. If we didn't capture some of that released energy of glycolysis in ATP, it would all be dissipated as heat. So the universe gets its slice of the pie, and we also make some ATP as well. In fact, even that 74 kilojoules per mole that's released is released mostly as heat, again, making molecules move faster, and it is a big contributor to us being warm-blooded animals. Part of the reason why we run at such a high body temperature is because of each round of glycolysis releasing so much energy. We'll see another interesting 
example of heat being generated by metabolism solely for the purposes of body heat and warmth once we get to the later stages of glucose metabolism after spring break. So to summarize what we talked about here, we started off talking about a little bit of a side note uh, of the regulation of glycolysis. We talked about step 1, step 3, and step 10 being regulated, step 3 and 10 regulated directly by ATP levels, and step 1 being governed by feedback inhibition, regulated and inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate. Then we talked about what happens to pyruvate anaerobically. Well, in muscle cells, as those muscle cells burn through all of their oxygen, but are still active, they need to yield energy a different way. And so they start to convert pyruvate into lactate. This releases energy, which is useful for the muscle cell, but it also regenerates NAD+, which is needed to continue glycolysis. On the flip side of it, for microorganisms that ferment, when oxygen is no longer available in the environment simply because the environment is oxygen lacking, those cells can take their pyruvate, convert it first into acid aldehyde through a decarboxylation reaction, and then take that acid aldehyde and reduce it to ethanol. That reduction also recycling NAD+, so that glycolysis can continue. Two energy-yielding uh, strategies, I guess, if you will, that allow cells to continue making energy via glycolysis even in the absence of oxygen. And we ended by discussing the energetics and the energy yields of glycolysis, kind of from the big picture perspective, explaining why these endergonic steps are allowed to occur, because glycolysis itself as an entire package deal process is energy yielding. So that's it. All done with glycolysis. We are now poised with two molecules of pyruvate, and as we resume after spring break, we'll see what the cell does with that pyruvate and how it can modify pyruvate in a way that allows it to feed it into the citric acid cycle where we begin ripping and tearing electrons off of it so that we can start wrapping up this story of glucose metabolism. Until then, as always, thanks for watching.